Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. Here at Cavanagh's HR, we're excited to announce that we have launched our crowdfunding campaign on the Indiegogo platform. You can help us save small business owners time and money by donating at https cavanaghshr.co crowdfunding. Our guest today is Ira Rolf. Ira, are you ready to be great today? I'm doing good. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Jason. Ira S. Wolf is a millennial trapped in a baby boomer body and president of Poise for the Future Company, founder of Success Performance Solutions, a TEDx speaker, top five, top five global thought leader on future work and HR, author of Recruiting in the Age of Googleization, and host of the Geeks, Geezers, Googleization podcast. Ira, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks very much, Jason. Uh, I've been anticipating this quite a bit. Lo love the conversation and congrats on uh, your, your crowdsource launch. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's 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 just a lot to do, right? Hopefully, it, it pays off for me, right? Because it, it is a lot of work, you know. Yeah, it uh, it sure is a lot of work. So I I, uh, I applaud you for doing that, uh, and congratulations, and uh, wish you the best of success. Thank you. So, Ira, what do you? I mean, you have a lot going on. What are you focused on right now? The well, I'm. You're right. I have a lot going on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're living in this uh, in in crazy times, and I'm I'm very grateful. The uh, if we if you and I were talking uh, 12 months ago in the beginning of March, uh, you know, we certainly didn't know we're, you know, we didn't think we were going through a complete shutdown, although that was being threatened. Uh, but despite that, uh, especially being in the HR business, uh, we provide pre-employment and leadership testing to, to companies. Um, I've been around for a while. That's, that's the baby boomer part. So I do have that under my belt. And my immediate uh, my thoughts were 2001, 2008, uh, a crisis. Uh, people stopped hiring. Uh, people start not only laying off, but they stopped hiring. They stopped promoting. Uh, they were more worried about how do we keep the doors open? And, uh, you know, and then the doors were slammed shut for so many businesses. And I fully expected that I would be, um, you know, my business would slow down radically and never lost a step. Uh, we've been busier than ever, which is a good sign for everybody else that's out there. And we can talk about that a little bit as well, you know, about the economy, the future of work. There's certainly, you know, I didn't have a lot of clients in hospitality, entertainment, transport and travel. Uh, so that didn't affect me a whole lot, but on the other aspect is uh, the only reason I'm busy is because other people are busy hiring people. And that's, that's a good thing. So uh, I've had an incredibly busy year uh, and uh, I'm very fortunate and it's been good, but I, I think that's uh, the sign of things to come. Uh, it's also going to make it much more difficult for, it's good. For, it's going to be good for people who have skills that from the job seeker side, um, people who have the skills are going to be in demand and have a lot of opportunities. Employ, employers, employers who were organizations that were struggling or are struggling to hire people, uh, just the tip of the iceberg. And, um, you know, if you're, if you don't have your act together now, then, uh, it's, it's not going to get better going forward. That's for sure. And, and hopefully we can, we'll talk about some of those things and what we can do. So our, um, so let, let's, here's a question for you. Let's suppose, you know, the vaccine's 100% cured, COVID goes away, at least in manageable, right? So what's gonna happen when this, this occurs? The company's gonna say, hey, hey, employees, come back to work, you know, come back to your cubicle nine to five, drive two hours a day back and forth. And the employee's gonna be like, wait a minute, I've already proven I can, you know, do as well at home, if not produce more at home. You want me to go back to old ways? That's not gonna happen, right? I, I think that's gonna be interesting that dynamic. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, just the concept of let's get back to normal is the craziest, it, it's an insane idea. We've never gone back. And going back to, to what? To January of 2020, it was good for some people, um, but it wasn't good for a lot of people. And you look at all the conversations, the controversy going on now, you know, with, uh, with DEI, diversity and equity, uh, gender pay, uh, racial, pay, you know, racial inequalities. Uh, there were whole groups of people that nobody wants to go back to that. Uh, certainly, having some some sense of normalcy, some routine, some predictability, 
in our lives. Uh, yeah, we'd like to go back. We'd like to go socialize. So um, I, I think one is, I just want to get the message out that there is no such thing as going back to normal. We will have new normals, but those normals are going to be waves of normal. Uh, a good friend of mine talks about, we're going to have multiple futures and, it's, and, and they're not going to necessarily be linear. It's not going to be, well, this is what the next five years looks like. And then the next five years and the following five years, we're going to have those, we're going to have multiple futures going on simultaneously. So within that vein is what does it look like when you go back to work? Uh, there, there are people, the, the odd, everybody has their different percentages, but it's, it's going to be pretty close to like a third, a third, a third. A third of the workforce is going to stay at home. And that's going to be fine for many people. And, and sometimes with even within a single company, there are going to be workers that uh, don't want to go back to that commute, that hour, two hour, three hour commute. They realized it was expensive. And now they, even if they're working, they're working those same hours, there's still, uh, they're, they're still the, a little bit more flexibility at home. They get time to spend with their families. Uh, and it's just not as exhausting to, to do the commute. So there's going to be a third that are full time at home. There's going to be a third that do go back to the office, uh, and we'll talk about what the office looks like. But there's going to be a third that goes back to the office, and there's going to be a third in between. That uh, the latest numbers I've seen um, is that it's going to be two days, two days on site, three days at home, or or vice versa. So somewhere in that, you know, half the time uh, people will work uh, at home and work remote. Now, that brings up a really interesting question: is so if you if you are a hundred percent going to work in a physical building, in a headquarters, in an office before. And now there are, there's a group of people that works remote. Well, that's fine and dandy. Um, so, but how, what does a team, what does the team look like? What if they're located now you've, the opportunity is you can hire people from anywhere because you can work remote. So it may not be, hey, we're having a meeting Friday, come on in because you may be located in Seattle, I'm in Pennsylvania. Uh, and you know, it, it, that's, a big, that's a big commute uh, to be able to do that. Um, but even the people who work two or three days, uh, there's companies that are cutting down the, the space. So maybe you can't even accommodate everybody there. So when you decide to have a meeting, some of those meetings are not always going to be collectively, it's not going to be a physical meeting. It's still going to be a virtual meeting because some people may be in the office and some people may be remote, working remote. So I don't think companies have figured that out. I mean, when we talk about going back to normal, I don't think employees uh, or the employers have really figured out what is the environment going to look like? What does the workspace look like? How do we handle meetings uh, when not everybody is on site? And at least for a while, uh, there's going to be some trepidation, even though people are going to have vaccines. Uh, certainly, all you need to do is walk into a crowded room and start coughing like we used to do. Uh, and people say, oh, I, I just I have a little cold or my, my kid has a cold and I, it's not really too bad. So um, but all of a sudden, people are going to take a different, uh, be a, you know, a different anxiety level of what's that, what, what that's like. So it's going to take a while to get back to normalcy. And but I, I think people are getting like they have in certain states, the all clear, no restrictions anymore. Um, not everybody's jumping at that. It, it's not a switch. This isn't. It, people talk about the COVID as a war, and the impact has been similar to that. It's been devastating and loss of life, um, but there is no ceasefire. I mean, it doesn't end. The bombs don't stop dropping. Uh, we're gonna have droplets in the air for a long time with variants. And so I, I again, I, I think ultimately we'll have a third, a third, a third, uh, but that creates a whole new set of, uh, set of, I won't say problems, but challenges and opportunity. So our, let's suppose a company is in, in headquarters in Denver, Colorado. And let's say they have 10 people that work in Denver. Well, they have 20 people throughout the University of the United States. Do you think the people in Denver have advantage of the remote workers or the remote workers have advantage of their Denver employees? Or how, does a, how do you work through that, right? To make sure everything's fair and equitable, all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, well, there's a lot to unpack there, Jason. So uh, we, we can talk about this for a while. So let's let's just talk, um, you know, as far as pay, I mean, so there's a whole controversy going on right now is that, well, uh, we had people living in San Francisco and New York and, uh, you know, they, they had an increase, they, they paid people more, but now they're going to Colorado or Montana and South Dakota and, and other areas. They just, they, they can come to Pennsylvania. It's, they don't have that same high cost of living. Uh, why do we have to pay employees the same way? Which gets into the whole controversy, were you paying them because of where they lived and, and compensating them, uh, giving them an adjustment on, on their geography, or was it because they were worth the performance? And there are people, there are many employees that are willing to take a cut uh, to have a better lifestyle, well-being, um, they, they moved out of the city, and instead of having, you know, a, a family of four that they were paying five, six, seven thousand dollars a month uh, to rent a uh, two or three bedroom apartment, they can buy a twenty-five hundred square foot home with a yard uh, for a third of that. Should they be penalized? Um, or the other flip side is, as many people say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to accept a 20%, 10% pay decrease um, because I have a better lifestyle. Uh, so, but companies are wrestling with that. And, and ultimately though, it, it's, it's gonna depend on the culture. Uh, is there a strategy to that? Or is the strategy from a management side of what can we get away with? And from an employer's employee side, from a worker side, is, is that how they're looking at it? Is, is my employer's cheap and they're trying to just get away with it, which isn't good for culture and engagement and experience and recruitment and all those other things. So it's the wild, wild west right now. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on it. Um, there, there is a reason to pay less uh, if people are working remote. The, the overhead also goes way down. Uh, many, you know, many organizations are closing some of their space uh, if they had multiple floors, they're eliminating some of the floors. So their overhead's going to go down. Uh, does that go to the shareholders? Does that go to the owners? Uh, does that, or should that be distributed to employees? Uh, maybe it should be a merit system that, hey, we have a couple hundred thousand or a couple million dollars laying around now that we didn't have expenses that went out for rent and other things. Uh, how is that distributed? And maybe that becomes an incentive program. Uh, but it, it really ultimately is going to depend on the culture. Uh, and some, some companies are doing well and some companies are screwing it up like they, they always did. Yeah, I think the challenge is from our reading, the companies who are getting wrong, the ones like don't communicate, right? They like last minute say, we're going to cut your, you're moving to Montana, we're going to cut by 20%. It's like, you know, communicating ahead of time as much as they can, right? I think it would have come to get in trouble. Yeah, and if, and if that was never, you're absolutely right, it's communication. If that was never communicated from the beginning, the reason that we're giving you, we're paying you this much, um, or we're giving you a 27, 20% bump or a 30% bump over what the average uh, compensation is, it's because we, we want you here and we understand that it's more expensive to live here. But if you move away, then we're not reducing your pay because you're not worth it. We're reducing your pay because the only reason you, you, you got paid $100,000 because that was a fair salary. And you, we paid you another $30,000 because we really wanted you here. But in order to live here, in order to, to force you to commute every day, we, hit, we were willing to pay that. But if we don't have to force you to live within this geography, which is a higher um, uh, living ex uh, cost of living, then that goes away. But we don't think less of you. But I'm not sure that was ever communicated before. So th there's definitely a PR issue uh, that is, is going to happen. Plus, we've got a shortage of talent. Uh, there is a shortage of talent. So just because that skilled person used to live within a 25 mile commute and now they live 500 miles away, does that make them less valuable? I. You know, and, and because companies are horrible at performance management, <laughs> they're, they're, they don't track that. I, I just, again, got off the phone with the client and they were asking me for metrics and how, what are other companies doing? And I said, it's really, really hard to get metrics. We're, we're on the pre, primarily on the pre-hire side. So a company has tests over three years, 50,000 people. 
I don't know who they hired. I don't know how well they perform. I said, can I get that data? And they go, well, what do other companies do? And I go, here's what, here's what I need from you. I need to know how many people you hired. I need to know who you hired. All I know is who you test, who you hired. And I need something as simple as ABC. A, we'd love to have a hundred more people like them. B is, yeah, we'd hire them again, but there's room for improvement. And C is we either terminated them or hope they quit. As simple as that. I don't, you don't have to dig down. doesn't have to be a long, sophisticated performance evaluation. All we need is a rating from the manager, ABC. And the so other, Ira, we can't so, get it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a big believer that HR people should be, <clears throat> should be business people. So this is kind of a slighted question. Two part question, from your point of view, what are business people getting wrong about what HR people should be doing for them? And what are HR people getting wrong about being business people? Well, first of all, HR people need business acumen. You, you are part of the business. So from an HR perspective, uh, it, it's a, is it the chicken or the egg? Is HR, it, and it, this is changing. So, and again, there's hundreds of thousands of people in the HR <laughs> space. So uh, it, it's always tough to stereotype, but as a rule, uh, and I hear this over and over again, a lot of HR people say, I'm just not very good with numbers. I love working with people or I'm really good uh, with data. You know, I'm good with compliance. Yeah. When I heard that, that always makes me laugh. And say yeah, or I'm good with, numbers. I'm good at training. Um, you know, I'm good at interviewing, but they're not good with numbers. Well, you, you need to be, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be an actuary, um, but you need to be okay with numbers, um, at least the basics. And more important than just being good with the numbers, you have to understand how the numbers impact the business. So just be able to, 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 to uh, add columns um, doesn't mean much unless you can interpret the data. You know, I always said that there's, there, there are people that are really, really good at creating spreadsheets, but if you ask them to interpret it, to read between the lines, to find the white space, they can't do it. That's the critical skill. That's the business acumen, the level of let somebody else provide you the numbers in HR. If you're not good at calculating it, get the change, get the report, and then be able to look at the report and interpret that. So I think part of the challenge is, is HR has a responsibility to become better have, have better acumen, become better, better analysts. Um, on the flip side is companies have, you know, notoriously uh, not even given HR a seat at the table. Uh, they have not, um, you know, they have not respected their input. And so organizations need to, you know, become much better at uh, respecting HR, uh, hiring people that have the skills that they need to have skills and uh, be able to, uh, you know, go that route. So I, it's a chick, it, 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 it's going to take both people. It's going to take HR uh, needs to become much better, uh, much more skilled, um, go beyond uh, the basic compliance and administrative task or just training tasks. Uh, and uh, businesses are, are, again, it's not just saying, well, we include HR in our board meetings or in our critical meetings, our executive staff, is do they actually have a voice and if they don't have the voice, is it because you don't have the right people? It's like, well, we'd give them the voice if we can trust the people. And that's a, that's a management problem. Get the people who have that or recognize the people in there. So it, it's, a, it, it's both. I, I think both parties are to blame. Yeah, and I think a lot of businesses, like they keep on hiring, like I'll call the old, the old top HR, like HR person only does hiring or manage, only does compliance. And they don't like at HR person add any value, right? They try to add more value, try to do more things like that's not your lane, right? And and, and then of course they keep on hiring the same old HR people that the stereotype keeps on getting, you know, reinforced and reinforced. Yeah. Well, but we didn't need, we are gonna need specialists. I mean, HR, it's like, oh, you're in HR, so we want you to be the trainer, our, our compensation and pay, our benefits. Uh, we want you to coach and mentor, we want you to be our EAP, we want you to do all these things. And people have different skill sets. I mean, some people are, are still gonna be much better on the compliance, admin, financial, analyst standpoint. And there's other people that are, gonna, are, are much more skilled and engaged uh, and competent at uh, mentoring and coaching and leading and training. 
Um, it doesn't mean that it's exclusive. You can't just say, well, I'm in HR and I'm on the people side, therefore, I, I, because I'm not good with numbers and vice versa, um, you, you, you're going to have to become much more versatile. Everybody is. I mean, everybody's going to have to upskill and some people are going to have to completely reskill. So I right, what's your take on this? And this is my, my opinion, what I've been observing. Like, it like you're like mid-level, senior level HR person. You can just go from job to job, you know, kind of easily, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. not easy, easy, but you know, hard. But people getting out of college or switching to HR careers, like it's impossible to find a job. I know like seven people, eight masters in HR, can't find a job, trying to get entry level. They're taking like customer service stuff. How, what advice do you have these new HR people to try to break in, so to speak? Uh, there's still a demand. And, and again, I don't, there may be some really competent individuals um, in, and maybe it's, they're in the wrong place. They're, you know, maybe it's their presentation. Maybe they're, they're applying to the wrong companies. I mean, we're, we're in an upheaval now. So, but I, the, the number of HR people who have moved around over the last year is incredible. I mean, every day, my feed, my, my LinkedIn feed is this person's accepted a new role, they've got promoted, they have a new title, they're working with another company. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. So I'm gonna throw back on, on some of the people. And again, it depends where you are. If you're in Man if you're living in New York, in Manhattan, in, in the city, uh, then yeah, maybe it is tougher to get an HR job because there's a lot of companies that have shut down. There's a lot of companies that are closed down. There's a lot of companies moved out. Uh, so that may be an indication, uh, but there are other industries, there are other businesses, there are other areas that are they're literally thriving. And there's not a day goes by, as I said, that on a LinkedIn feed, I see one of my connections has moved, um, uh, multiple people have moved. Uh, there's also not a day that goes by that I don't have, uh, that I don't get a request. Hey, if you know anybody looking, um, but it, it's the distribution. So I, I think, if you're struggling to look, um, it may be taking a look at yourself. How do I reframe the resume? Maybe it's not just sending out the resume, but some of your experience. If you are, if you're a recent grad and you don't have a lot of HR under your belt, um, you may have to bite the bullet and, and do an internship. Or, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of online courses. There's a lot of things you can do and build your skill set that way. Um, but uh, the, the demand for HR is huge. Uh, but again, companies are redefining what, what does HR mean? What does that role mean? And uh, candidates are often saying, but I, you know, I just paid $100,000 and got a degree in human resources, which didn't even exist when I went to school. Uh, but, it, you know, but now they have that. So they are coming out better educated than just bringing somebody in as your receptionist who you decide is going to do payroll, who decide is going to do your interviewing. Um, you know, that's how most many HR people grew up. Uh, they started in a completely unrelated role and ended up evolving into HR. Now people can choose that as a profession, as a career, uh, but, um, you know, experience does help uh, as well. Ira, from your point of view, what makes someone a great HR person? Well, let's go back. Um, well, one is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a very, very general answer. Um, because HR, you are responsible for the people, so human beings in your organization. Uh, so let's talk about you are the leader of, even if that's not your title, you are a leader, you're an advocate for the employees within your company. And in order to do that, um, you have to at least be empathetic. You have to be able to walk in their shoes. And in most cases, HR are employees. So they should be able to do that. Um, a little bit. But on a general case, and this is one of the rabbit holes I've gone down over the last few years, one of my, one of my interests, which has become one of my passions, uh, is, is talking about adaptability. Uh, and if, if you talk about what I believe HR should be responsible for going forward, is not just making sure that you have your I-9s in place, that people get paid, you know, people, it is important that they, that if they, they're supposed to get paid weekly or bi-weekly, um, that they get paid, uh, that the systems work, if they have a problem that you're there to help them. But beyond that is people are fearful. I mean, people are anxious about the future. 
Uh, we live in, a, a, one of my colleagues talks about that human beings are addicted to certainty. Uh, that, and we're, we're, we're all of a sudden, we, we're going cold turkey <laughs> because we went from an addiction to certainty and all of a sudden, nah, certain, there is no more certainty. Um, there is no more drug and you're gonna, we're gonna be living in a state of, uh, of perpetual uncertainty. And people are terrified of that. Uh, people are uncomfortable. They don't have the skill set, And so HR's responsibility is, is really going to be uh, to help people become more comfortable with uncertainty. And that includes HR, because HR is not comfortable with, with, certain, with uncertainty either. Uh, and we look at a couple different traits, and, and these are skills that we you can identify within HR or help build. So is what we're going to, is HR maybe the first place to do this, but then beyond that is they need to be able to mentor and coach other people. So we look at things like grit and resilience, and grit is how do you become, um, you know, more, how do you, how do you continue to endure? And it's not no pain, no gain. But how do you continue to just keep moving forward one step at a time during a tough time? And then resilience is that that ability to, to, to recover uh, from a setback. But it doesn't advance you. I mean, the problem is, is resilience and grit just gets you back to where you were. <laughs> it just allows you to plow ahead uh, one day at a time and, and, and you bounce back. Uh, but those are sometimes people don't have those skills. So HR needs to have is the ability to help create an environment that supports people during the most difficult times. Because no matter where you are on the scale of, 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 of whether you're failing or whether you're thriving, there will be setbacks. But beyond that, it's, it's helping people being that growth mindset, establishing a culture that we're gonna make mistakes. Uh, even the top leaders of all the companies, everybody's, you know, a lot, lot of different terms out there. We're, we're, we're flying the plane while we're building it. Um, we're faking it till we make it. Um, all those things are definitely in the past. If a CEO said, I'm, hey, I'm glad you're on for the ride. We're just faking it till we make it. <laughs> that may, I'm not sure a lot of people would apply or stay or not start looking to, to switch jobs. But the fact is, is that we all are. Everybody is. Nobody has the answers. Nobody, nobody knows for sure what's going to come down the pike. So having that growth mindset, um, having a, you know, being a little bit more forgiving, being a little bit more empathetic. Uh, I'm not saying tolerate mistakes, tolerate failure, um, but we're all in this together. And then uh, the ability to unlearn bad um, things that things that worked in the past that just won't work in the future. Um, not only learning new things, we talked about learning, reskilling and upskilling, but part of that is, is not just piling on more information, but um, unlearning some of the bad behaviors that we had. I, I do an analogy of that is it's like defragging your hard drive. Uh, a couple months ago, I was getting all these errors and my hard drive um, said, your hard drive's filled and I go, can't be. I've got uh, like a terabyte of information. Um, or a gigabyte of information and or no a terabyte of information. Uh, and um, I looked and I had like a couple, you know, like a hundred gigs of, of uh, temporary files. Uh, I had every download of every image of every video that I had and you clean it out. So you defrag it, you get rid of the stuff that you don't need. You get rid of the duplicates. Um, you store them away. You put, you know, they're, they're there if I need to pull them out. Uh, but I don't need them on an everyday basis. And, and that's really what I'm learning is. So uh, the qualities of HR, uh, I think overall is uh, need to become much more empathetic and show it. Uh, people can be empathetic and not show it. Uh, <laughs> some, uh, and then, but they, they also need to become a lot more adaptable. Uh, if, if you have the technical and functional skills, if you know what to do, but how you're doing it, isn't as effective as it should be, then the difference between success and failure is gonna be how you do it. Ira, talk about being a, um, I believe you say a millennial trapped in a baby boomer body. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm on screen. So you can see, I got a baby boomer body. <laughs> uh, people tell me I look a little, little younger than I am and that's, that's a good thing. 
um, but it's still a baby boomer body. And believe me, the, the, the knees, the, the hips, the ankles, <laughs> uh, all those things definitely show it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily reflect what's going on up here. Uh, many of my peers, many of my colleagues have retired. Many have been retired. Um, I, I've got my, this particular business I've had for 26 years. And frankly, I get up in the morning thinking it's a startup and it's not a startup because I'm failing. It's a startup because I'm always reinventing it. I'm always reimagining what it could be. Uh, and, you know, I, I try to be very aware of what industry trends are, uh, but that's the millennial mindset. And maybe it's a Gen Z mindset. I've had the millennial in the baby boomer body tag for a couple of years. And, and now the youngest generation is Gen Z and even going younger than that. Um, but it is, and I, I wrote a book in 2008. Uh, and for anybody who was around in the workplace, Jason, you probably were, were there too. Everybody was talking about the, the, the four generations and how different they were. And especially the millennials and the millennials get slammed for everything. They got blamed for bad attitudes. They got blamed for if a business went down, they got blamed for the financial crisis. They got blamed for the housing crisis. They got blamed for everything. If you were a millennial, you were responsible for everything bad that ever happens in, for mankind. Um, not true because millennials didn't grow into that. They were, you know, they, they weren't uneducated because they chose to be. They, if they didn't get the education that they should have had, it was because of the baby boomers and the people older than them that didn't take care of the education system. Uh, so, but there were, like every generation, there's good people and there's bad people. There's motivated people and there's demotivated people. So there's a whole series of, of things going on. But I wrote the book, I sort of fell on that bandwagon and said, hey, maybe I can help. And I'm gonna explain the difference between uh, the oldest generation, which is called the traditionalists, the veterans, the baby boomers, the Gen X, and then the millennials. And if I explain the difference, then everybody's going to understand where that is. But it was still based on a chronological birth when you were born. So if you were born in 1950, you were a baby boomer. If you were born in 1970, you were a Gen X. If you were born in 1980, you were a millennial. Um, so if you had all those things, is that, well, that explained it because you were born at a different time. But within each of those generations, there were people that were motivated. There were people that were highly skilled. There were people that weren't so skilled. You had people that, that were always reinventing themselves. You had people, you had 25 year olds who acted like they were 70 and you had 70 year olds who acted like they were 20. Uh, I chose the latter pattern. Uh, and so when, when people talk about generations, uh, I, I'd be careful at labeling people based on their age and look more at their mindset, which got back to what we were talking before. If I'm a millennial, if, if I'm a baby boomer, um, yeah, maybe because of my age, I, I've developed grit and resilience, but that I have a very open mindset, that I have, uh, I can deal with paradox. Like I try to make sense of things that um, shouldn't make sense to somebody else who's seeing it for the first time, only because I've had that experience. But I have that growth mindset that I'm not set in my ways and, and that I recognize that what worked, what got me here may not get me through the next 10 years, especially if I wanna be in business. So I, I think uh, the millennial in the baby boomer body is I don't care what generation you pick, I don't care what body you got. Um, it, it's more important to think um, in appropriately and appropriately is everybody's gotta reimagine who they are going forward because the environment's going to change. You, there is not going to be a vote to say, well, let's vote on it. Do we want to go back to normal and go back to the way it was or not? We couldn't agree on that anyway, especially in the United States. <laughs> we, we'd still have the 50-50 the, the split. Uh, but if by individually, we're going to have to either accept that we're moving forward uh, or, or you know, trying to go back. Uh, as my, uh, I just heard this the other day. It, it was a great question. Are you running toward the light or are you running from the darkness? And that's a completely different mindset. Running from the di mind, darkness is a fear of what, what, the, what the darkness holds. Uh, and running toward the light is just the, is, is a path 
and hopefully we're, we're all we're doing that, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's better. Uh, in the darkness can lie a lot of opportunity, and in the light can, can you know, at the end of the tunnel could be a cliff. Uh, so there's, you, you have to decide which what you're doing and how you're going to approach it. Ira, how do you personally keep track of all like a keep with all the tech changes, all the you know social media changes, AI, deep learning, on and on and on, right? How do you keep up? I mean, how do you keep track of all that stuff and keep up to date? I wish I said I had an easy answer. It is really, really hard. Uh, my first book I wrote, it was called The Perfect Labor Storm. And the book, um, if you go look at it, was literally, it was a fact book. And what I did was every week I had a newsletter and I'd list five trends that I read that I thought were interesting. And I put them in. So at the end of the year, I had like 200 trends and over 10 years, I had 2000. So I had all these trends. And what I did was I categorized them into uh, this was happening in education. This was happening with demographics. This was happening with women in the workplace. Uh, and um, it got hard. It got hard because there were so many different things. There were so many different aspects. And so I increased the list to 10 and that didn't help. Uh, I, in 2007 at the crash, the financial crash, I actually moved to a new community. Great timing to buy a house. I bought it at this peak. <laughs> and then the market crashed. Um, and I moved into a new community and, you know, talking about hiring people, just nobody was talking about hiring people. Uh, but I, I always had a knack for marketing. Um, I was already using, this is 2007, 2008. I was already on Facebook, um, you know, and that was as a baby boomer. So uh, where everybody else was pretty young. I, I started to play around with Twitter um, I had a YouTube, I started to have a YouTube channel. So I was doing social media, you know, even that back then. And when you start, it was easy because I used to teach, I actually started to teach classes. It's a community college and people come in and it was, I was teaching the basics of what it was and how you can use it for business. But in the middle of one class, Facebook, I had all these slides, not slides, but I had handouts and and instructions in the middle, literally in the middle of a class, Facebook did an, an update. So things that I was teaching them to do didn't exist anymore. And all of a sudden we couldn't, I couldn't even find how to make an edit. Um, and then it also rolls out, which means half the class had the old version and, and some of the class had the new version. I quickly realized that I couldn't be an expert in social media. I could be an expert. I, I would have to devote all my time to Facebook because Twitter was coming along. And then YouTube started to make changes. Uh, and then Pinterest showed up. Uh, there were, it was constantly a barrage of new things happening. And uh, that's what life is. And, and I don't, I mean, I do social media for myself. I don't teach it. I, I just couldn't keep up with all the change. But I, I did go down the road of future of work and I follow quite a few people. Um, on what's happening. And, but even when you talk about the future of work, uh, uh, it's not only AI and machine learning, which is, we're really not there yet, but everybody claims they got AI. So we won't, we won't go into that story. Um, but you get into things like natural language programming um, processing. So, you know, it's that it's Alexa, you know, uh, hopefully that's not on or my Alexa will come on <laughs> right now and start talking to me. Uh, but Alexa or Siri or Katana, whoever you're talking to, uh, you know, that, that that's, there's more and more of that going on. And that could be used going back to our conversation about HR is rather than having to have someone physically in their office or on a screen answering a question, many of the questions that get asked during the day can certainly be put into a knowledge base that's uh, that an employee has a question about how many hours you know what is this covered under the policy or how many day how many days do I have left in my uh, uh, for verification uh, that all can be automated and that's a combination of AI and as a combination of natural language uh, uh, NLP um, natural language but you also uh, you know what's going to happen to companies what about 3D printing. How is that going to affect construction? How is that going to affect manufacturing? How does it affect uh, skills that we're going to require? So there's all these things. So when we talk about technology, we're talking about um, 3D printing. We're talking about AI, machine learning, sensors, uh, the Internet of Things. We're talking about devices. Uh, 
it, it's huge. And it's a, long, it's a long answer for what could be very short. I have no clue. I feel like I'm drowning in it. I feel that while I'm recognized at the top of the list by a couple organizations as you know, one of the influencers on future work, I really do feel like an imposter at times because there are other people that seem to be more knowledgeable. Uh, they write every day about it, about the advances. Yet when I talk to them, they feel like imposters too. Things are, when, when the experts are feeling like they're falling behind and trying to keep up with everything, um, that's, that's a bit worrisome, but it also fits the definition that we're living in this age of perpetual uncertainty. Yeah, I know we were talking about Clubhouse where you got on a talk, and like a Clubhouse, man, like it's another great platform, but is it just another time suck, right? Because there's so many good conversations. Oh, it's definitely a time suck. <laughs> and you're like, well, you know, like, yeah. And, you know, and there's so many changes going on. It depends what you want. I mean, so that's a great conversation. For those who don't know what Clubhouse is, um, you can go to joinclubhouse.com. Um, and, and all that does is tell you a little bit about what it is. And you can, if you're interested in, in signing up, it's, it's only on the uh, iOS, the Apple platform right now. So you have to have an Apple device to even log in. Uh, and then it's by invitation only. So you have to be in, if you have to know somebody that, that can invite you in. Which is uh, brilliant it, marketing it, it, on their part, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it's gonna evolve, but there's you know millions of people that are on there. Um, as I said, it's definitely a time suck. But if you go in with, hey, I'm gonna meet people or I'm just gonna to, um, learn something, think of going to a conference and it's not necessarily in a convention center, but it's in the city. And every, every house, every business, every, every office has, has an open door and they say, Here, here's, here's my agenda and I can select any place I wanna go for free to learn something. That's what Clubhouse is like. It's this huge conference center and people are talking everything you know, from marketing to the future of work. It's not all HR, by, by the way. Uh, how to start a business, how to use Clubhouse, um, you know, how to eliminate poverty, um, how, how to, how to uh, uh, you know, what should we be doing about racial inequality, uh, social issues, uh, climate change. So there's a million places you can go. Some of them are interesting, some of them are not, but there's a lot, a lot of choices, plus you're getting a perspective of people around the world. So if you go in and you have time on your hands, uh, you'll fill it up quickly. Uh, and but I wouldn't discourage people because I've been this morning. I I actually moderated uh, a room, a clubhouse room. We talked about adaptability, and we had about twenty people, and about four people, four or five people came up on stage because I, as I said, I, I wasn't there to present or speak. Or uh, I was there to moderate. I, I had certainly my opinions, but I wanted, I went in there just to collaborate with other people. It's, it's really like an interactive, you and I are interactive, but can you imagine if we can bring other people into this conversation right now, uh, we, what that would look like. Uh, and they may challenge us, they may agree, that, or, or they can take this conversation down a different road. Uh, so Clubhouse is interesting. Um, I, I think the fact that it's, it, it's sort of crude right now, it's in beta, they're, they're, they literally are building it as, you know, every day there's a new update, there's new change. Uh, they're not even on the Android devices yet. So that's gonna be a, a big improvement, uh, but it's, it's not the end. It's not the only platform there's, there's you know, they, they call it, um, it, it's basically an audio, an audio based social media. Uh, we, there's, there's half a dozen that are already out there and there will, there will certainly be more, but I think that's just the one step on the journey is how do you take the LinkedIn or the Facebook tag? How do you take the like and turn it into some type of a, a more robust engagement between the two of us? Not that you post something, Jason, and I like it, but is, is what else could be there? How do we make it easier to interact? How can I really, rather than have a choice of I can like or I can clap, how can I how can I express my feeling when I'm feeling through that? Uh, that's what's going to happen. Um, so a lot of these tools are going to change, but it's it's definitely a rabbit hole. All this stuff is a rabbit hole. Uh, the future is yes. a rabbit hole. They definitely are. So next, let's talk about future work. 
so is a day coming where all the robots and AI are going to do all the jobs for us? Or we just sit out and drink beer and barbecue every day? Um, it no, I it, it again. It depends by industry. Um, you know, we 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 were talk. I, I was interviewed the other day. We a podcast that focuses on the construction industry, and they said, "So, how do you think?" Um, the trades, you know, it's so hard for, for people to, to find people in the trades. And it is, there's no question about it. Um, and they're good professions. So that's, you know, gets a whole this conversation about education. And you know, if you want a good career, you know, do you need a college degree or could you be a welder or, or a plumber or HVAC tech? Um, but they, he was really struggling with understanding how the workplace was going to change for construction and where many construction uh, companies are they have the work but they don't they can't find good project managers they can't find enough superintendents um, and what's a superintendent do they go on site and they look around they see what's going on they look at they check the progress why can't you do that with a drone Great you can point. yeah you can um, so do you absolutely need a, a superintendent driving through all the traffic going site to site? You have a big area. Um, maybe he needs to be there sometimes, but he doesn't, does he need to be there all the time? Uh, but they need the skills because a lot of the people that grew up in the trades don't necessarily have the digital or technical, uh, technical skills. Um, uh, how will 3d printing, um, you know, change that? I wrote this about, I wrote this in my book. Uh, you have... And you, you would think I lived in the HVAC world, but I don't. <laughs> but there, there are great examples. And because I do have a residence and I do have a, you know, I, I do have heat and plumbing and all those things I can relate. But it was like, so currently, um, you know, we had service on our, our um, heat pump and the part uh, guy came and he says, oh, you need a part, but I don't have it. We have to order it. I'll go back to the shop and see if one was there. And then he called and says, I don't have it. Well, he'll be overnight. We'll be back tomorrow. Okay, that makes sense. But that's so like 2019-ish. Uh, what would happen is if he goes into his truck and he has a 3D printer and they can print the part right there. We're not there yet, but it could be right there. Or what if they sent a drone over with the part? From wherever it was. Um, how does that change work? And now people may say, what's that have to do with me? What's that have to do with work? Well, the work site for somebody in HVAC or plumbing or electrical or, or any of the trades, the work site is your home. It's your business. You know, th that's, that's where they work. They work on at your site. So all those things of how, how does the workplace change for even something that doesn't seem like it would be knowledge-based uh, in the future. Now, for more service-oriented knowledge-based jobs, we already talked a little bit about that, is gonna be remote work, what's collaboration look like? Uh, everybody says, oh yeah, we're, we're much more comfortable doing this type of a thing. Uh, you and I have probably been doing it for a while. But um, you know, there's people that never would have thought of being on a Zoom call before, and there is Zoom fatigue, uh, but they had to learn how to do it. They had to get comfortable. They had to figure out a setting. They had to get positioned. Uh, they had to had, get comfortable talking on screen, but it's still sort of a two-dimensional conversation. It's all we did was you and I are talking and we just put a screen in the middle, but, it, but how would we interact? How, you know, how do I shake hands? How do, how do I engage? How do I explain something to you that may be on, 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 on your website, but you don't even know how to show me what that website is? Um, you know, that's leading into virtual reality, um, which, which, you know, other than the technology right now, the headsets are heavy. I mean, uh, people not, may not even know what I'm talking about, but, you know, I've got an Oculus. I've got a headset. It's a little clunky. They're at least down to two, three hundred dollars now, so they're not in the in the fifteen hundred dollar range. Um, but people have to learn how to use it. But but if if the technology gets smoother, 
And in two or three years, we are able to just put on maybe a lens that's something like my glasses. Uh, and all of a sudden you and I are not looking through the screen at one another and the people that are listening or watching in this are not necessarily looking at a screen, but they're in a headset and we're looking on either side and we're right there together in a virtual space. That's what's missing in, in Zoom. That's what's missing in all these venues is that we took how we interacted at work, put a screen in between us and said, oh, we're virtual. No, you're not, you're digital. All we're doing is exchanges. There's just millions and millions of, of bits and bytes that are flowing through the screens, thrown through the internet, coming up in pixels. And that's all it is, um, but we're still distant. But how do we take that distance and make it local? And that's the next step and, and we'll, we'll be there, but that, that completely changes the environment. Uh, of how we do things. So the future of work is just evolving. Now with that is you can't have a comp, what's company culture look like? How do you have engagement when you have people distributed across the country that may have never met physically before? Uh, how do you develop that engagement? How do you manage somebody? How do you keep them in the zone? How do you keep them in the flow? How do you make them feel that they're part of a company culture where before all, there were a lot of toxic cultures, just because you had a physical building didn't mean that there was a culture that people walked in and go, aha, I feel better. It's not Disney. Uh, some people, they walked in and they start choking because it, it, on the way in, they start choking because it's a toxic environment. So, but how do we, but building a culture remotely is difficult, but a lot of companies have figured it out pretty quickly. There is a, you know, you can use technology, you can use, a, um, you, you can have ongoing conversations with things like Slack, um, you know, some of the tools that are out there, but certainly the monitor, you know, certainly the just doing it through a screen is, is, a, is a bit challenging. Yeah, one thing I think as a society, we either don't realize or forget is like how often we actually upgrade skills, right? I mean, it, does, it happens more often than you think, like even go back to the day when the car first took over, remember reading somewhere that there were people like protesting the cars because all the people would like go behind the horses, pick up the dog shit, uh, horse shit, right? We out of jobs, right? I mean, it's a continuous process, right? We're always upgrading skills, correct? Yeah. Oh, well, there's definitely going to have to be an upskilling and a reskilling of the skills. Some of, some of those jobs that they that used to exist just don't exist anymore. They just plain out, you know, don't exist. So next, talk about your podcast. I believe it's called Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. How long have you been yeah. doing that? We'll keep on the uh, Googleization theme. <laughs> uh, I've had it for uh, two and a half years. Uh, we've done about 170 shows. Uh, we, we broadcast live similar to this. Uh, and uh, it, it actually started as a radio show. It's, it's live, it was live talk radio. We haven't always done a lot of talk, but it was live talk radio. Uh, we, um, and we bring on a guest, just like I'm um, your guest, uh, experts in the field. We've had people talking about future work. Um, yesterday, uh, we had somebody talk about actually investing in, or, or last Wednesday, we do it Wednesdays, uh, investing in diversity and social impact. It was an angel investor. And she exclusively works with startups and entrepreneurs who have a social impact uh, that they're looking to change the world through medicine or lifestyle uh, or, or climate change. Uh, and she works a lot with uh, minorities. So 50% of her investments are people of color and another 50% uh, are um, uh, female, are women, entrepreneurs. Uh, and currently that's her portfolio. Now within the people of color, there's some men, um, but basically uh, it's, you know, that's her focus. That's who she looks for uh, to, to invest in that. Um, you know, next week we're having somebody talking about uh, the future uh, of women in the workplace, uh, diver you know, from how technology sometimes discriminates against not only minorities, um, but women uh, of, of the hiring processes and it's built in there. So how does that get changed? 
Uh, we've had people talking about employee experience, candidate experience, recruitment, hiring, you name it, but it, it all fits under that umbrella of, um, you know, we're talking about people, old and young, wired and tired, and technology, and how it's changing the world. And uh, it's, it's fun. We, you get to meet, just as you do with your podcast, you get to meet a lot of interesting people. So um, on your, in your company, you do online, you have like 2,600 online courses on your, on your website, if I'm really correct. Like, how do you keep them up to date? That's all I want to know. Like 2,600, that's a lot to keep up to date. It's like, it's an automated process you do. You have a team. I'm sure you can't do that by yourself. I mean, that's a lot. Yeah, well, not only don't I do it by myself, I'm actually in partnered. I, I actually have, I'm, I'm a, a reseller technically from another company. Uh, that does that. It fit well into our branding, and, and we created a relationship with them. Uh, I, I'm not a non. I mean, I'm not a trainer. I don't have. I'm not an or, an instructional designer. Uh, I, you know, I can make my own videos, but I, I couldn't do it for. I, I, I want to put myself out there with people that are experts in designing learning. Uh, so I, I work with a company, um, and if you go up to our website at successperformancesolutions.com. Uh, you'll see some of the, the offerings that are there, but there are there there are now more than 2,600 courses. Um, I, I don't know what the count is, but it may be 2,700 or 2,800. Um, so I rely on them, uh, but they update them uh, every month. I, I get an email uh, as an update, and there are some that have been updated that might have been out for a year or two. So especially if it has to do with compliance. Um, so we, we, in, in the, in those offerings, there's things such as, you know, teaching people how to use word and Excel and how to be a better service person or how to be a better supervisor, uh, how personal development. So there's some things that aren't going to change overnight, but there are compliance, um, videos in there and they may change as the laws change. So how do you update those? So every month, um, they go through the, the file and, and update those, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's much more difficult. Obviously, with a video, you recorded the video, and if if they they have to, you have to re-record the video. I mean, it, it's sometimes tough to edit that, um, or you can take out that section, but you want to make it you know a smooth transition. Uh, but uh, and and other times, there's new ones that come on board. You know, so last year when I actually introduced them, they had I, I've been I was in conversation with them for quite a while, and I just had to find the right time they released a whole section of COVID-19, what a company should do, um, you know, what are some precautions, it was also educational for the employees. And rather than companies trying to go out and do it on their own, that was included in the portfolio. Uh, so they, they put those out there. Now, a year later, some of what they were talking about then, uh, some of the protocols uh, and some of the knowledge that we had at that point is different. So they're, they're not as, those specific courses aren't as relevant, so they update them. So, um, you know, again, you, you need to really work with, um, for, there, are, there are people that have built good courses, online courses. Uh, I can tell you, I tried it. I built one for my, for my book, Recruiting in Age of Google, Googleization. It's a lot of work, <laughs> it's a ton of work, and then something happens and you have to change it. So that's not my expertise. So I rely on other people to do that. The, the core part of our, my business is really working on, um, we, we provide 90% of my activity is working with companies, helping them hire better. And that's done through, uh, pre, we do pre-employment and leadership assessments. So how do you, how do, you do these assessments? Well, again, I, I rely on people that are experts on building them. Uh, so uh, I, I, again, uh, I don't, as you know, I, I give the example there, I, I've driven a, a vehicle, a, a car for a long time. It doesn't make me an expert at repairing it. There are people that are really, really good at building the vehicles and there are people good at maintaining the vehicles and there are people that are good at driving the vehicles. Um, I drive the vehicle. Uh, so from the assessments, I rely on organizations, uh, industrial organizational psychologists um, and I work with a number of different platforms on that. So we offer, and, it, and there's a huge difference because we offer assessments um, that test for skills like typing, data entry, Word, Excel. Um, there's a right and wrong answer. People either know how to do it or they don't. Uh, so those are relatively easy to create. 
Um, but I didn't want to be a technology company. I had the opportunity a couple times to invest or, or buy a, a software company or a company that made tests. Uh, I didn't necessarily want to own a software company. Uh, I'd rather just provide their products. Uh, so there, we have skill testing at that end. But we also do leadership testing. We do integrity testing. And that's a combination of uh, more traditional assessments that are a series of questions. Do we agree or disagree with those type things? Uh, you may be familiar. We don't provide Myers-Briggs MBTI, but many people may be familiar with that. That shouldn't. That's a great development tool. It shouldn't be used for hiring. Uh, but we use. We have DISC, which is a comparable one. DISC. Um, but we have uh, three or four different platforms that that utilize the Big Five model or the ocean, what they call Ocean model. Uh, that's been used in businesses for uh, close to 70 years now. Uh, they, they identified through the research five traits that were pretty universal. They weren't uh, psychological. Uh, they're certainly about our personality, which fits in psychology. Uh, but they were that they were they can be correlated with business activity. Uh, so you know, again, extroversion and introversion is one. So again, if you're in sales or uh, you know. Maybe you're more inclined to be an extrovert. If you're more internal in accounting or engineering, maybe you're more inclined to be an introvert, but it's not exclusive. People use them inappropriately. Um, I, I know really good salespeople who are introverts and I know really good uh, engineers who are extroverted. Uh, and uh, so again, there's some interpretation that needs to be put in that, uh, but the tests are all you know, valid and they all, there's three elements that we look for. Um, is one is are they validated and everything we use has been validated, which means they test, if, if we're testing for extroversion, that's what it tests for. It's not testing for something else. Uh, so every, everything that we test for has been validated. It's reliable, meaning if you took the test today, would it be would you get a similar result tomorrow or next week? So it's not related to our mood. Um, so that's the second factor. And the third factor is a job relevant. Um, you know, there is you can test for attention to detail, but if the person doesn't need to be detailed, uh, you're gonna discriminate against people who may not be good with math. Maybe, they, maybe they're just dyslexic, but if that doesn't matter, then don't test for it. You shouldn't do that. It's not the test that's wrong, it's that you're using the wrong test. So we look at um, validity, reliability, and job relevance on every situation. And sometimes I can figure that out with a five minute conversation with the, with the client. Because I ask him, I ask him one question. At, at the end of a year, if this person that you hire using one of our assessments works out, what is it they'll have to accomplish? How will you measure success at the end of a year? Do they have to sell so much? Do they have to produce so many widgets? Um, do they have to reduce turnover? What do they have to do? How are you going to measure their success? And once you and believe it, well, you'd believe it because you're in the field. A lot of people don't have that. They don't know. Well, it's sort of a changing position. Well, then how do you evaluate them? How do you know? Because you might have hired them on one thing and then six months later you change your job and they're not any good at it. That doesn't mean it was a lousy test. It doesn't mean that they got a good person. You hired them to do one thing and then you changed. So if, if you want flexibility and you want people to be good at everything, then you need to hire people that or train them. Uh, so I always ask, and from that, I work backwards of how do they accomplish that? What do they have to do? And then we can test for it. Um, so it's, it's a, it sounds comp like it's this complicated process. 99% of the clients we have are small, medium-sized businesses. Uh, we have a couple large ones. I got a couple publicly traded companies as well. But most of the clients we have are small, medium-sized businesses. Many times they don't even have an HR person. They don't have somebody dedicated to this. And the assessments really help give some object objectivity to what they're doing. Um, obviously, many people aren't good interviewers. It's hard. Uh, interviewees, candidates have, have, have often got, undergone more coaching and training how to be interviewed than interviewers have learned how to interview. Um, you know, even resumes, you know, people, people hire people to write the resumes. Um, people aren't always trained at how do you screen a resume? You know, what should you look for? And how should you take that information and interview people? So there's, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot to be done, but the testing, 
uh, is really a third party objective way to give insight. And we don't suggest you use it instead of interviewing. We suggest you use it to improve interviewing because if you have an outlier, if it exposes a weakness or a vulnerability, then it makes your interview better because you can focus exactly on the area that might show up in the workplace. So let's say that you're looking for somebody that there's a lot of interact. You're looking for somebody who's in, um, who can inspire people. You're looking for people that can motivate. Your, your last manager, the complaint was he never he sent memos. He didn't talk to people. Uh, so you're looking to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, and you, you, you get a result and it says, the next person has great reviews, tremendous experience, but they're, 40, they're in the 40 percentile of introversion. Um, should, oh gosh, that won't work. We needed somebody different. Well, no, you can talk to them and find out how do they handle that? What do they do? What have they learned? Um, are, do they have good self-awareness? Do they understand that sometimes they have to come out of their comfort zone and engage people that you just can't keep se sending them texts and memos that you know, sometimes you have to walk down and or pick or do a Zoom call. Um, and so th there are ways around it, but it, it would expose a vulnerability during the interview and help improve it. I, I do, as I said, I will repeat it. I don't recommend um, it's not as easy as saying, use our test and you don't have to interview anybody anymore. And that goes for anybody's test. It's not just ours. That's just not a good best practice. And you get, you'll, you'll get in trouble, you know, doing that way. Um, but if you use it to enhance your, your interview and your selection, uh, it's incredibly valuable. So our, the, the recruiting space is pretty crowded, right? I mean, there's all these one person HR recruiters, you know, there's um, recruiting companies who do the old school. It's like every day there's like 10 new AI, HR tech recruiting companies. <laughs> that are, We're going to fix recruiting. We're going to fix this. But it doesn't like anything's going to be fixed, right? It's like there's still a hiring disconnects, recruiting disconnects. Is recruiting or the hiring process getting better or is it just this loop that keeps on going over and over again? Uh, wow. Uh, so, yeah, I'm in that discussion all the time. Um, is it getting better? Yes. Is it getting better fast enough? No, because it was pretty far behind. And a lot of, you know, they call it the HR tech stack. Uh, it was, I've been in some, some pretty rich conversations about this lately. The HR tech stack, uh, you know, it started out that even, even the spreadsheet is a piece of tech. <laughs> it's a technology. So it's rudimentary, but it's, so you have a recruiting and you take all the applicants you have and you throw them into the spreadsheet. It, what, it shouldn't have been just data collection. It should have been the, the ability to analyze it and, and make your process better. Um, but then we went to ATS and then the AT, and then you, and the ATS was built for the employer. It created a pretty horrible candidate experience and then companies got better at the candidate experience. And then they said, oh, you need, we can add text onto it. So because people don't, your candidates don't pick up the phone. They don't respond to voicemail. They don't, check their emails, but if you text them or you're on WhatsApp or using social media, it's a good way to do that. So now, okay, we need another piece of tech to, to go on to there. Uh, what about video conference? Oh yeah, we're gonna use video now for everybody. Uh, so there was, we, we built this stack, we had a foundation. Uh, I, the picture I want you to create in your mind is, is the Jenga tower. If you're familiar with Jenga, you know, little blocks and you build them up and then you try to slide one out and you put it someplace else and then it, eventually it topples over. That's sort of what the HR tech stack is. That's sort of what's become of recruitment. So is it better? In some degrees it has been because we can now, you know, companies can process hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of applications quickly and filter them out. Now there's problem. there are problems with the algorithms but that wasn't a problem with the technology. That's a problem with the companies bought the technology to fix the broken process. If your screening process, if your job description, if your job ads just are like throwing a shotgun out there, if your job ads discriminate, you, you, you use words that are male oriented and you're trying to create a more diverse um, population and attract women into man dominated male dominated fields into nursing and engineering um if you still use uh if, if the words you use can be 
unintentionally biased and discriminate that it would turn off minorities or people of color or ethnicities. Um, so it, it, it became a science. It, it became an art and a science of how do you, how do you change your job posting to be universal and, and not inherently discriminate? If you, if you have the best technology in the world and you're using, you're still using a copy and pasted job description written by an employment law attorney, um, it's, it's not gonna attract the best people. Um, a technolo all technology has done is make bad processes worse. <laughs> And, but if you have a good process, then you select the technology that can help automate that. And the automation isn't to replace the human being, it's to get rid of the, rid of the, get rid of the tedious work, the repetitive work. Uh, so instead of spending all the time or hiring somebody to put all the names in a spreadsheet, where then you have an ATS and you hire people to create the status reports and screen them out. And there's companies that have an ATS and then they print out all the resumes, which is ins insane. Um, you know, it sort of defeats the process. But if you have a good process in place, you know the type of screen, what are the screening questions that can weed people out, then um, it's improved. So like everything else is we're sort of going through this division. We're having the companies that get it and are improving they're getting better a little bit at a time. It's not, everybody recognizes that it's far from, I wouldn't say per, it's far from perfect and may even be far from good, but it's getting better. But you have other companies that are still doing this manually. It's insane. I mean, they, they put a job up on, on Indeed and they get hundreds of p applications of people who are unqualified who just hit a quick apply, and then they complain about the quality of candidates. Uh, there are good people out there. There, it, it's just too easy to it's too easy to apply for a job. But you're not going to by complaining, you're not changing it. But there are ways to imp if if your process is imp if you improve your process, you will improve. You will eliminate the problems that most people have. I, I if you, if anybody listens to any of the interviews I've done, and I've done lots of them. One of, I always say the bar is really, really low. The good thing about companies, especially in recruitment and HR, you don't have to be perfect. You don't even have to be really good. All you need to do is be better than your competitor. And the competitor may not be in the same industry, by the way. They may be a competitor chasing down the same type of people in your business, especially at the frontline work. But you don't have to be really good because companies are really bad. So, um, but yeah, I, I do think Jason, fortunately it's, it's improving. Technology is a big part of it. Um, but the tech, the HR tech stack is like this Jung, Jenga tower. and People keep slapping on one more piece of technology every year uh, when the whole thing really needs to be almost torn down and rebuilt. And it's happening. There are, there are companies that are out there that are re-looking at it. Um, and, and, but it's, it, it's a big issue and there's nothing perfect yet. So it's like the, the early days of the computer. I'm going to wait till the next one comes out so I don't have to get rid of this one. And then all that happened was they kept accelerating it. So it, it, it you know, if, if anybody is still waiting around to wait for the, the perfect computer that is going to, you know, if, if I spend this much money, I'm not going to have to replace it in two or three years. Um, it, that's not going to happen either. So our, I believe I read that you do an average of hundred podcasts a year. I mean, that's insane. Like, like, so it's a hundred podcasts you do a year, like. Do you, well, I I do fifty. Oh, uh, well, I do somewhere between forty eight and fifty two. I, okay. I don't do fifty two because we take, we, you know, never. We're, nobody's going to listen to what I have to say on New Year's and Christmas Day. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean that year. you. I mean that you're, you're the guest on a hundred podcasts a year. Yeah, I, that I didn't do it I, last year. I was uh, about seventy five, uh, which is a lot. Uh, the, and then again, I also had the opportunity. In the spring, when nobody knew what was going on, I was like on one or two a day. Uh, so there, there, the, the, but it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, especially doing fifty of my own, and then, you know, even doing one additional one, one or two a week. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I actually I've had a lot of interviews, and I'm grateful. Uh, gets the word out. Uh, I get to learn conversations. Somebody asked me something in a certain way, like you did today. Um, you, you learn from the, the I learned, I learned from my hosts. I learned from my guests. 
Uh, and sometimes, you know, some of the things I shared today, I just learned this week. And, uh, you know, it comes out and it, and it helps reframe it. So follow up with a question. And we talked about this a little bit before. Talk about the points of people putting themselves out there, whether you're, you're regardless of your age or your entrepreneur or just a worker, the point of putting yourself out there in today's day, today's age. Uh, yeah, that, what, that's, that's a really excellent um, question. Um, there's a lot of talk these days about being, you know, having your personal brand. Who are you? Uh, how are you going to identify yourself? Um, and it's not just, oh, yeah, I got a social media page and that's who I am. Uh, well, it may, may be. I mean, some people are, are sharing more, but a lot of people don't share a lot of things. They use them for business only. So you really don't get to see that they have a dog and a cat and a kid and, you know, whatever. Uh, I mean, that's changed a lot, too, uh, with Zoom. We, we got to actually have a lot more authenticity and transparency. We got to see people inside people's homes. I got to see where your desk is. I got to see where you work. Uh, may, may not have gotten to see that before. See the cat jump up on the desk. Uh, see what you drink. Uh, there, so there's all those things. Um, the, you know, where we're going down the road is, um, you know, is, is that as well? Uh, I think the, you know, that, that is certainly changing um, how we, you know, how, how the podcast, how the interviews, how those conversations, um, you know, are going to change. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, what is our personal brand? Um, People are going to have to have a personal brand. Um, I don't think it's going to be everybody on the planet. I mean, everybody on the planet has, planet has a personal brand. And that goes back to even our testing. Oftentimes, people know you better than you know yourself. Um, they go, no, I don't think I'm that way. And then everybody laughs. <laughs> uh, I don't think, uh, you know, a, a report might say you're nitpicky um, or you know, sometimes you speak without thinking and you go, no, no, I used to do that, but I've gotten a lot better. And then everybody around you that knows you well sort of laughs um, because they, they know you, you still, you do it in part. The, but personal branding is important. Um, you are your brand. Um, when you go represent yourself, you are your brand. You're not your job title. You are not your, you're not your education. Um, you know, people go in and go, tell me about yourself. Well, I've got a four-year degree in biology, and I have six years of experience, and I, and I, and I, you know, I'm a HR generalist, or I'm an HR professional, or I'm an executive. That's not your brand. That's not who you are. Um, you are not defined by your job title. You're not defined by the the years of education. People think they are, and in the past, that was important. You know, if, if you went to Harvard or Yale versus, um, you know, Clarion State University, it was like, yeah, that was part of the brand. People were getting away from that. Um, there are many people. It's not, it hasn't been turned off, but people are starting to look at who are you? Why did you choose that school versus another? Um, you know, who are you as a person? What can you contribute? What value? It, which, which raises an interesting question on on where does the personal brand fit? I, I read this, there's a book out by Gary Hamill uh, and it's, I, I'm drawing a blank, so I apologize to his co-author. It's called Humanocracy. And it talks about moving from a bureaucracy to a humanocracy, but they, he didn't ask this directly, but it popped into my mind, is that how many companies out there say people are our most important assets? You know, it, it's, on a, it's in a million mission statement, value statements, posters, um, job ads. In the future, and this is being dictated by partly the millennials, but Gen Z, the workplace, changing environment, future of work. What if an organization was an employee's most important asset? And by that means, I'm not saying that in the, like in the past, like my parents or grandparents, um, is that the company sort of owned you, that they took care of you, that they paid you, they gave you benefits, gave you a retirement plan, they took care of your health insurance, your disability, all that sort of stuff. I'm not talking about just tangible. I'm talking about that the company is an asset in your career growth, that maybe your your You'll be here for four or five years and we'll give you every tool in the world, but we recognize that you have more potential than 
what you can realize if you stayed here. So we're going to help you grow. We're going to help you in your well-being. We're going to help you stay healthier. Um, we're going to help you grow. And then at some point, we hope there's an opportunity here, but you may leave, but you'll always be an alumni. Um, I mean, that sounds like a, an idyllic, you know, crazy, you know, crazy ass kind of conception. But that's ultimately getting away from just saying people are our most important assets and they go, oh yeah, we're starting to put them on our balance sheet. Yeah, we can measure people now and see it is a, a very good, it, it's, we got a good return on investment on our asset. That's culturally, that's not gonna work anymore. But the reverse is how can an organization be the employee's most important asset? And what do they want out of life? What's their career? I mean, it's all gonna be different. Not everybody has high aspirations. Everybody has different goals. Some people want to make sure they have enough money in the bank to pay, pay for their kids' education. Other people, you know, want to take care of their parents. Other people want to travel. Other people want to get a, a, an advanced degree. Um, what can you do to help the person? But that's that has to start with the personal brand. If if you don't have your personal brand, you don't understand who you are, then the company is going to shape that for you. But if you do have a personal brand, then you know what your goals are and you can look for employers uh, that help support that. Uh, and there's a lot of conversations around that. And uh, I, it's gonna take a long way to get there. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt, but we had a tipping point last year and there's a lot of organizations that had a wake up call and uh, we'll, we'll see. Our next question, we're gonna go back way, way back in the day. Why did you wanna be a dentist in the fifth grade? <laughs> No idea. Uh, it came my turn. Unfortunately, I was a W and I was near the end of the alphabet. Um, and the, the teacher went around the room and, uh, you know, part of it was influence from my parents. Um, you know, you grow up, uh, they owned a retail store in a small coal mining town. Uh, you know, we, they, they made a good living, but it was, you know, it was hard work. Um, you know, the goal of every aspiring parent was to, that you your kids at, for that generation would graduate college um, and, you know, especially get a degree in, in a, a profession, you know, accounting, law. Uh, so somewhere um, I decided I was going to be a dentist uh, and I was just stubborn enough that, you know, at every, every family event, um, you know, anytime anybody asked me, what do you want to do? And you go, well, you still want to be a dentist? And I go, sure. Um, but I had, uh, there was no inspiration from family. Uh, it was sort of a goal that I set. Uh, I did well. I did well in high school. I did well in college, did well in dental school, um, did well in my practice. Uh, I had a hugely successful practice. Um, but as I said in my TED talk, I loved it. I learned that I loved everything about dentistry, but dentistry. Um, I loved the journey, which is also part of, um, uh, what we talk about a lot with the growth mindset is there are people that love the journey and there's people that, you know, only love winning, but winning is never enough because then you want to win again. Uh, so some people are, are motivated by the journey and we're all on a journey. So everybody needs to get comfortable with that aspect. Uh, but I love the challenge. I love the steps getting there. Um, I loved opening the doors on my practice. I loved expanding the practice. I loved building another building. I loved hiring more people. I love growing it. But the problem is with dentistry is ultimately it's a relationship. If, if, if you come to me and I tell you, you need a root canal and a crown uh, and $5,000 worth of treatment, I can't tell you, great, I'm going to have you, my associate do it. They go, no, 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 we're, we're, we came to you. We like you. We want you to do it. So there, there's still this end of the funnel. It's tough to scale. I mean, I, I can do it for, you know, I was able to do it for cleaning, but I learned 30 years ago. Um, initially, it was going to be, I was going to consult uh, just dentists and I would do it part time. I quickly learned I, I, I just didn't enjoy going into the office even 20 hours a week. And uh, so I got out, but in my TED talk, I talked about how I loved everything about de dentistry, but dentistry, but it also relates to today. People say, well, how do you make that switch? I mean, how do you go from dentistry to HR? How do you go from dentistry to business? Um, 
I loved everything. What I loved about the dentistry, I loved leading it. I loved growing it. I liked the marketing of it. I liked working with people. I liked the team building. I liked the service. I liked improving processes. I liked systems. I was into, I was computerized in 1989. That's 31 years ago. My office was completely computerized. We had those intraoral cameras where you can put a little camera inside and shows up on a big screen. I had the first version of that in 1991. Um, I, that's what I did. Leaving that practice 26 years ago, um, 25 years ago, uh, when I walked out the door, all I did was say, well, I'm not going to drill and fill anymore. That was the only thing that changed. I started a business. I marketed. I networked. I had a concept. I put it together. I didn't sell dental services anymore. I sold consulting services. Um, I worked with people, I helped people, I inspired people, I helped them get over their anxieties, their fear. Now it became a fear of testing, you know, what, what happens if this person doesn't work out? What happens, you know, if, if the test isn't right? I mean, people have all these perceptions of things that are different, but uh, I'm the same person in that respect of how I approached running a business. So I often said I had um, a, a marketing business that just happened to be, well, I had a business that happened to be in dentistry. And if I got more specific, I probably had a marketing business that just happened to be in dentistry. And now I have a business in, in HR or a business in, in marketing. And maybe even bigger than that, because I do a lot of writing and, and uh, speaking and podcasts. Uh, I have a content creation company that just happens to, to uh, be in the HR space. So Nick, um, can you talk more about your company, like how it came about, what you're working on now, and what's your, what's the future for your company is going is going to be? Yeah, again, another good question. Uh, the I've had it for 25 years. Um, I, I probably conceived about 27 years ago, but I've had officially 25 years. Uh, we're in the 26th. Um, Success Performance Solutions is the name. Um, it evolved. It didn't start out this way. It evolved into testing, pre-employment and leadership testing. I really liked the diagnostics. That's the part I liked about dentistry as well. I love I love solving the problems that people had. I just didn't want to do the work. So I was the radiologist, the diagnostician. I wasn't necessarily um, the surgeon, although I did like surgery, by the way, but I didn't like doing it over and over again. Uh, the uh, so we're still there. That's evolved. Uh, we've had a couple new platforms, new improvements. Uh, testing is, has, in these day and age has to be much more savvy as far as um, the, the mobile experience. Uh, you know, 96% of every, 96% of adults in the U.S. own a smartphone. For many people, this is the only device that they have, the only connection to the internet and to the rest of the people that they got. Most, going back to recruitment, most job ads, most work is done on a desktop prior to last year. And they send the message to somebody who has a phone this big. Um, so, you know, the next evolution with testing became how do you make a better candidate experience? Somebody likes taking an assessment, but. How do you make it a better experience? So that's evolving. Um, there is a new, one of the new tools we have, the adaptability quotient is actually a chat bot that you don't, it, it's not a statement that you agree with or disagree with. You do agree and disagree with the statement, but it's all done through a chat bot. You have a conversation. They're literally doing the, the, the assessment through questions through the chat. So, you know, it's improving the candidate experience. I'm excited about that. Uh, more and more companies are looking, how do we hire the right people? You know, if we hire this person, uh, we really need, you know, sometimes people just need warm bodies, but uh, what type of training and education, what, what type of onboarding do we need? That's evolving. So rather than, you know, we're, we're getting more involved in that. Uh, five years from now, um, what's testing gonna look like? Uh, I'm excited about, I, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I, ideally, maybe it's, there's going to be more virtual reality, augmented reality, some types of simulations uh, that we can use. Uh, that's certainly going to be, uh, you know, a key. Uh, 
but uh, you know, hopefully I'm still doing the business then. I think we'll be in some, some form of, of uh, testing. Um, but you know, I, again, I've been doing a lot of work on the adaptability quotient, uh, uh, helping people become more comfortable with change. And uh, our focus is how do you help people get, get the courage and get, build the confidence which will give them hope for a more positive future because a lot of people are pretty scared right now of what's next. So you have a quote, I believe it goes, resilience is for sissies, AQ is your mojo. Can you explain that? Yeah, resilience is for sissies. So the, as, you know, resilience became the, the word of the year in 2020 um, by a lot of organizations. Uh, people talk about, um, but resilience is just bouncing back. It, it's, like, it's like weeble. You know, you knock, it's a punching, the old punching bag, you knock it over, it comes back, come, but it doesn't help you grow and thrive. And, and the problem is, is when we come out of this pandemic or any of the, of the change, the world is gonna be different. The environment's gonna be different. The labor markets are gonna be different. Uh, the demand, the, the, the consumer markets are gonna be different. So all that's gonna change. Um, grit is per perseverance. So if you think about grit, it's, it's, it's being, it's that vehicle that plows through that brick wall. It's that SWAT machine that kind of breaks through the wall. It gets through unscathed. Um, but uh, again, the environment around it is, is pretty similar. It just survived. So there's so much emphasis put on bouncing back and, and going back to normal that I think people think that if they, if they survive, that's gonna be good enough. The problem is, is things are gonna have evolved a great deal um, the market, again, the markets, the skills we need, the demands on us, the expectations, the uncertainty is still going to be around. Uh, so we talk a lot about moving to the next step. How do you get people to grow and thrive? And uh, I mentioned this earlier, mental flexibility, uh, being able to deal with that uncertainty, being able to deal with paradox. Um, you know, we, we hear two different, you know, two different um, sides of the news. How do we make, how do we make sense of it? We're going to have to become better at that. How do we become better at, at that growth mindset, at that openness of, of um, becoming more comfortable with not being perfect and, uh, and unlearning, unlearning those behaviors. So we're working, uh, resilience is for sissies. Um, that's a little bit brash. <laughs> it gets people's attention. Uh, but it's not going to, it's literally not good enough. It just gets you to a point that you can say, I'm a survivor. But when you look around, the world is going to have moved past you. Uh, and so are a lot of other people. And so are a lot of opportunities. But it does take courage. I mean, it takes courage to persevere. It takes courage to bounce back. But it is, we need people not only to have the courage, but the confidence to take another step, to try it again. Um, again, nobody's gonna flip the switch and, not, and we're just going back to some way it used to be. Uh, so how do you get people to take one step, then a second, then a third? At, and hopefully when they've done that, then not only have they done taking the third, they'll take the fourth step on their own. And when they do that, the world looks a little bit better. And that's the hope. So we, we talk about resilience is for sissies is about not just having the courage to get through this and calling yourself a survivor, but having the confidence and most importantly, not feeling that your job's gonna be stolen by a robot, that you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Um, what, what you need is people, you know, I, I wake up in the morning, I don't wake up depressed. I, I, sometimes I get depressed by the end of the day. <laughs> you know, if I listen to the news too much or if I look at the, you know, some other things. Uh, but the reality is, is I wake up every day with a pretty positive outlook that I'm excited to go to work. I mean, sometimes it's, it's Blur's Day or Groundhog Day <laughs> lately. Uh, but I've got a lot of things on my plate, a lot of things I want to do. Uh, I don't look at like I'm doing this for nothing because maybe the world's going to end tomorrow. I'm doing this because the world's going to be here and I want to be ready for it. How do, I, how do you get more people to do that? And uh, so resilience is for sissies is about helping more people get comfortable with the world we're going to live in. And, uh, you know, we need a lot more people that are, are less pessimistic and more optimistic. Ira, do you have a favorite social media, media platform right now? Um, do I have 
do I have a favorite? No, because they're all sort of a pain in the butt and, <laughs> and the time sucks. Uh, I use, uh, because I'm, I'm B2B, I use LinkedIn the most. Uh, so I, I certainly enjoy that. Um, I, you know, most, a lot of people don't think, don't think of YouTube as a social media, um, but you know, we, we use it all the time, whether it's how to look up something, how to do something, a cute video. I don't do cat videos, but I, I do, <laughs> I do a lot of one minute videos, like an excerpt, you know, something that I might've done on a podcast and go, Hey, it was, that sounded pretty good. So I'll take that one minute clip or two minute clip out. Um, so I use that, uh, clubhouse, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying it so far. I mean, the first week I was, a, it was really a, a time suck, you know, it's like, where did the week go? <laughs> I was, I was, you know, I was even, uh, I, I threw it on when I went to the shower, instead of listening to some music, I, I threw it on clubhouse just to listen to a conversation. Now it's, you know, sort of that edge has come off, but I, I do hop in and yesterday I was in a great conversation um, with someone uh, the day before I hopped into a room and met a lot of really good people, learned a lot um, in the half hour I was there. So I, I guess if I had to say, which is my favorite at the moment, it's probably Clubhouse. But ultimately, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm also, I'm on them all the time, but I try to watch what I do. I definitely know what you mean. Ira, um, you, you're writing a book now, or you just released a book. Now, the, the recruiting in the age of Googleization first came out in 2017, uh, last year, last February. Uh, we did an update. I added uh, almost 100 pages to it, uh, added uh, six chapters, updated it a bit, some of the things we didn't talk about. Um, there's probably a book, well, there's a book definitely in my head. Uh, it's, it's probably in, in 100 different pages on in Google Docs at the moment. Uh, definitely going to be writing something. I don't know if it'll be an ebook or a full book uh, or an update to uh, the Googleization uh, on adaptability. Um, it, that we, we I, I'm from a personal passion and a purpose. There's just so many people that are fearful about the future, and uh, again, I want to get people comfortable with it. And so, yeah, there, there, there's a book coming out, but I don't know what it is. The closest to that is probably uh, I've got a free ebook up on my website. It's when the shift hits your plan, which is the subtitle of my <laughs> this book. Uh, that was the original title, and that talks about mostly, uh, you know, the change, the future of work. But that too needs to be updated. That's almost two years. That the, the most current edition of that is about two years old, and so much has changed. So um, I, I I do a lot of writing, so people or, or a lot of talking, a lot of videos. So if, if you want my book in, in like many chapters in, in, in draft form, um, you know, you can li either listen to the, in, in my interviews go up to the Success Performance Solutions site and uh, under about me, about us, uh, you'll see almost all my interviews are, are there. And uh, that, that'll, that'll form my next book. Ira, is there anything that I said I asked you that I didn't? Oh, we covered a lot of territory, and I appreciate that. Th thank you. It's uh, one of the more in more comprehensive, in-depth interviews, and frankly, running out of things <laughs> to, to talk about. Um, yeah, uh, you know, for for people, please connect with me up on uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Check out my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com forward slash Ira Wolf. Uh, the site currently is down. Hopefully, it's going to be up over the weekend or so. Uh, so in the meantime, you can, um, you know, can email or connect with me, but uh, we are, uh, I do have an offer that we're giving away free books, you just pay for the shipping so I signed you a sign, I'll, I'll send you a signed copy of my book. Uh, and, um, and you can get it for the, you know, cost of what mail is. Uh, and uh, so but if right, it the the site is going to be is normally join.googleizationnation.com. It's join.googleizationnation.com. Uh, but as I said, I know they're doing some work on it. Um, and the last time I checked, it was down. Uh, but uh, the, so the other way when people are, you know, if, if you want it, uh, just reach out to me on, on LinkedIn or go up to Googleization Nation. And so listen, we have the link to his gift and his social media links on our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinsatrblog.com. And don't forget to support our crowdfunding campaign at HTTPS. CavendishHR.co slash crowdfunding. So Ira, we're coming in with a talk and you give us a lot of great value today. Was well, there anything else you want to talk about as well? Can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything else you want to talk about? 
No, uh, please be safe. Um, you know, adaptability. I, I again, I for people that are whatever role they're in, whatever stage of their life, whether you're recent grad, you're in school now, and you're looking at your jobs ahead, or or you've got a good job. Um, adaptability has been identified by um, a lot of organizations as the number one in demand trait. Uh, and uh, so again, uh, there there are ways that you can be more comfortable living in an age of Googleization or an age of uncertainty. And uh, I wish everybody well. If anybody wants to reach me, um, we talked about how to do that. And please uh, stay safe. Ira, thank you for your time of the day. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. It's a pleasure. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.